This morning, our, our preacher is Vicar Timothy Ison, and uh, he'll be sharing God's message. And so, and we like to call, of course, Vic Tim, right? So, uh, Vic Tim, would you share God's word with us this morning? Yep. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing this morning a series called The Way of Wisdom, Ancient Wisdom for a Modern World. We've been looking at wisdom the past six weeks, and we've been discovering that wisdom wants to be found. It calls out from the streets, and then we see how then it can be applied to our lives. We looked at wisdom as it relates to justice and injustice. And that's when we look to the and when we that when we look to the source of injustice, we will find sin. And then we looked at wisdom as it relates to money and how God should be a part of every financial decision that we make. And then Pastor Brian looked at the unwise persons, and specifically three different kinds: the naive person who lacks experience, the fool who knows better but acts in the unwise way anyway and the mocker or scoffer who criticizes those who try to do the right thing. And then last week, Pastor Brian looked at God's plan for marriage, that from the beginning, it was supposed to be us in perfect harmony with one another, perfect, holy relationship. This morning, we're going to be looking at some more ancient wisdom from the book of Proverbs, which should be able to help every man, woman, and child in this building begin to build better relationships with every person they meet. It's a worthy goal, a big goal, we're gonna try and do it. But first, since uh, this is the last time I'll be speaking about Proverbs, I couldn't resist listing a couple of my favorite Proverbs, and the, my, my very most favorite one is, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips, which is just a beautiful image. But I shared this with some of the fourth grade boys at Camp 46 this week, and. Uh, looked at me like I'd grown an extra head. An honest answer is like, what, the grossest thing in the world? An honest answer leads to cooties? Are you trying to get me to lie? And of course, I would, not, I would be remiss if I did not mention the wifely triumvirate. Many know, and rightly so, that the epilogue of Proverbs, which is a description of the wife of godly character, is, a, is an awesome uh, uh, way to look at uh, the, the wives in our lives. Uh, it's a model for strong women. But there are other uh, proverbs that are not quite as flattering to wives, including a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. And then there is better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. So you can hear the dripping inside the house. Now he's on the roof. A little bit further, let's go to the desert. Better to live, he's not even in the home anymore. He's not in the same county. Better to live in the desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife, wrote Solomon, the man with 700 wives <laughs> and 300 concubines. So, I mean, you know, just, you know, percentage-wise, you're going to come up with a few bad ones. Last week, uh, Pastor Brian spoke about God's plan for marriage, and this week will seem a little similar. I'd like also to talk about relationships, but not just between husband and wife, but between all friends and relatives and even strangers. Many people from our culture have begun to recognize that the wisdom from Scripture, and particularly from Proverbs, have extremely practical application for our lives as Christians, particularly in the way that we communicate with one another. Let's look at a couple in, in particular from our key Bible passage for today. With his mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous escape. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. And especially my new favorite proverb, a word, oops, sorry. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And the key word here is aptly, as in appropriate or just the right word. Uh, the message version of the Bible renders this passage, the right word at the right time is like a custom-made piece of jewelry. 
I hope by now that we've banished the childhood, ridiculous childhood mantra, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. An argument can be made that the Bible is almost more concerned about what you say than about what you do. We don't have time to delve into that subject today, but Jesus, in uh, the fifth chapter of Matthew, compared calling someone a fool to murder. And the third chapter of James has beautiful and frightful metaphors about the power of the tongue. For our purposes today, though, know that God cares very much about the things you say and the joy and pain that those words can cause. Words, as well as gestures, looks, and touches, actually have great power to affect our relationship with people, God, and ourselves. And John Gottman has made a career out of studying them. Dr. Gottman is a psychologist who co-founded the Gottman Institute at the University of Washington. He is known for his love lab. It's, a, it's an apartment in which he can observe uh, married couples or, or fiancés uh, uh, interact with one another over a weekend, and he, he can predict and this has been doing this for 17 years, he can predict with 90% accuracy whether the couple's marriage will succeed or fail after observing them for only three hours. These predictions are not based on whether the couples agree on the big issues like money or politics or religion or whether they're cat people or dog people uh, or morning people or night people, which are the usual barometers of success in a marriage. Gottman's formula is scientific and mathematic in its nature. The formula is too complicated to go into this morning, obviously, but I want to look at the foundation of Gottman's research, the tiniest emotional building block, which he calls a bid. There we go. Oops. Back one. Now we're good. A bid in common language refers to either commerce or cards. If you're a painter and you submit a bid for a contract, if you have the lowest bid, then you might get a job in poker or some other kind of gambling things, you can bid a quarter or in euchre or bridge, you can make a bid on a good hand. Gottman describes a bid in terms of a potential emotional connection. A bid can be a question, a look, a touch, a gesture, any single expression that says, I want to feel connected to you. Common examples of bids are initial greetings to friends, hot enough for you, to little old ladies crossing the street. Can I help you with that package? Can I help you get across the street? Two, status updates on Facebook, which I'm starting to realize should actually be called Bidbook because they are messages shot out into the universe with a button where you can like and a button to comment. And so all, almost all status updates are bids, like this picture from one of our members today with the update that reads, flowers my husband sent me to congratulate me on the new job. He is the best. And that's seven exclamation marks. Yes. And so underneath that, you have all these comments. Oh, isn't he sweet? He's the greatest. You know, congratulations. What's your new job? So all of the, this is like a, a definition of a bid right here. Really good one. More important than the bid is the response to the bid. And Gottman breaks those responses down into three categories. Three categories. Turning toward, which is a positive uh, response to a bid. Turning against, which is negative or hostile. And turning away, which is perhaps the worst, which is ignoring the bid. And this works not only between husbands and wives, but between bosses and employees, parents and children, friends with each other, and also with complete strangers. Let's take a very common example. Who is here is still in school of some kind? You're still in school. Raise your hand. Okay. What is the number one question your parents ask you when you get home from school, from the beginning of time until now? How was school today? Right? Dumbest question in the world, right? Okay. So, we have here, this morning, an actual teenager who will answer that question in three different ways. Can you count up, come up here, Maeve? This is my daughter. Give her one clap. There you go. Good. Way too many. All right, so, uh, by the way, I stopped asking this question years ago. Instead of saying, uh, how was your day at school, I started saying, uh, tell me two things you learned today. Write this down, this is good stuff. Because then they have to actually think about what they learn, and if they have learned nothing, maybe to a different school. That would be good. Anyway, so, uh, here is the uh, uh, turning toward. So, Maeve, how was your school, how was school today?
that was, yeah. As you can see, turning toward is completely, a completely pleasant response. It acknowledged my question, gave specific examples, and wonder of all, ended with a question guaranteed to further the conversation. Sadly, this exchange has never happened in the history of mankind, so we'll <laughs> go on to uh, number two. So, yeah, how was school today? Turning, this is the turning against. So, how was school today, Maeve? This response, mixed with two parts contempt, one part sarcasm, and one part smart aleck, will likely cause anger in the flabbergasted adult who might begin the remainder of the negative responses with the statement, all I asked was an innocent question. The third and most common response to this question is the turn away. So, how was school today? Um, Maeve, how was school today? Uh, how was school today? <laughs> it's just wild. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> I couldn't have planned that even. If you're a parent, yeah, thank you. If you're the parent, how likely are you to bid for an emotional connection to that child again? That child in particular, especially. <laughs> At least the turning away, or turning against uh, conversation actually is a conversation and you can, might actually begin to bring that back into something less than hostile, but the turning away response leads to a chilling effect for future bids. And bids are not just about school. Bids range from how are you to would you like fries with that to will you marry me and encompasses all the ranges in between, each demanding a response. So let's try this. How are you? Good, yeah, that, that's the normal one. Fine, good, yeah, okay. How are you really? See, because sometimes the bid needs a counter bid, because if the response is sort of automatic in the way that we normally talk to each people, and you really want to build that no emotional connection, make a bid again. So, and in th this is in fact part of Stephen Ministry, is that Stephen Ministry training is to, to, to not just be glib about the, the, uh, the initial bid, but to really delve deeper. Uh, into how people actually are. Uh, I hope that this knowledge of bids has the same effect on you as it did on me the first time I heard about it. I began thinking about all of the bids that I'd made in the past 24 hours after I'd heard about this, and, and it was ashamed at, you know, a lot of the turning against and the turning away. Certainly there was some turn towards, but uh, far and away it was turning against or turning away, and my vaunted Finnish stoicism ended up looking an awful lot like turning away from emotional bids for connecting with me emotionally. And what I loved about this knowledge is that I started to become conscious of every bid and response, and not just mine, but people in the community as well. I began making it kind of a hobby to see bids and responses, and I was up uh, training up uh, this week at CenturyLink Field as part of our uh, national youth gathering fundraising effort. We're gonna be doing concession stands up there at, uh, at CenturyLink Field for the next, uh, next three months or so. And uh, there was a bartender, because it was all the different people were doing training, and there was a bartender, and people had to, do, to re up, so they had to, to redo this, this, this uh, training. And the bartender goes up to a young, attractive woman and says, hey, couldn't help noticing it when they called for bartenders to stand up. You stood up. And I hadn't seen you here before. Are you new? My name is Rico. <laughs> the young woman gave him a knowing stare, did not offer her name, sipped her water and said, yep, I'm new, but that wasn't. <laughs> I thought, ooh, bad bid. <laughs> bad bid. So I'm going to sit here for 10 seconds in silence and let you think about why I'm talking about bids and responses in church. God is the almighty bidder, and we respond to God's bids the same way we respond to each other's bids, by turning towards, turning against, or turning away. But though we often turn against and away, God is faithful to God's people and desires us to turn toward through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
God's bids for our welfare are well documented from the very first pages of Scripture. God bid to give us a place to live. Genesis 2 reads, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God bid to give us each other. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God bid to bless all people on earth through the Hebrew people. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God bid to give us freedom and an everlasting law in Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. When people turned against God, God bid to give them a king. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Do you hear the pain in God's words? He's given us a bid, and we rejected. We turned against that as our response. As they have done from the day I brought them out of, up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. God's bid is like a mother's love for her child. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. God bids for us to live with him forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Can you think of any bid greater than sending your son to die so that the world can be saved? That is the ultimate bid, the ultimate gesture the ultimate act of putting it out there. And unlike the bids we make to each other, God's bids are for something much greater than an emotional connection with us. Though, incidentally, it is that personal connection, that personal relationship we have with our Creator that sets us apart from other religions of the world. God's bids have eternal significance for us. And let me be clear, Turning toward God will get you no closer to salvation. That is by the power and grace of God himself. But when we turn toward God's bids, we will necessarily be turning toward one another. So while our responses to God's bids don't count for salvation, they certainly matter to those around us. Because when God bids you to pray for someone in the hospital, the relatives and nurses and friends will see your response and give thanks to God. When God bids you to hug someone who has just found out their dad has cancer, that person can feel your response and give thanks to God. And when God bids you to be a camp counselor, the one who needs you can feel your response and give thanks to God. And God, when God bids you to stop an argument you didn't start with a word of kindness or humor, your spouse, friend, enemy, child, or clerk can hear your response and give thanks to God. My prayer for you is that you begin to see God's bids in your life and turn toward them through the power of the Holy Spirit. May your bids for an emotional connection with friends, relatives, and strangers be wholesome, straight, and true. May your responses to others' bids always be positive and turn toward and never against or away. And may this knowledge increase in you an awareness of your responses to the love God gave you in the life, death, and resurrection of his dear son, Jesus. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, we praise and thank you for your constant love and affection to the thousands of generations of those who love and obey your commands. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to respond to others as you respond to us with forgiveness, grace, mercy, and unconditional love. In the name of your Holy Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tim. That's way better than Dr. Phil. All right, appreciate that. May the Lord bless you and keep you.
Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's stand together.